If this parachute man has to eject from his plane, it's gonna take some time to fall, but the question is, how long? Welcome back to Engineered Bets. Today's line is 1.65 seconds, and it's your job to take the over or the under. How on earth was the line set? Well, he dropped from an altitude of about 2.38 meters and was released using a sophisticated delayed release mechanism. If we assumed no drag and solved it using kinematics like last episode with the soap dispenser, you might expect it to take 0.7 seconds for him to reach the ground. However, since the whole point of a parachute is to create drag to slow down the fall, assuming constant acceleration would be a big mistake. Instead, Newton's second law was used to solve for the acceleration. Not only is there a constant force due to gravity, but also the force due to drag that opposes it. If you substitute the equations for each and solve for the acceleration, it looks like a mess. But most of these are just constants. The mass is the total mass of the parachute string in his body, which during recruitment was measured to be 4.5 grams. Rho is just the density of the fluid that the object is falling through, which you can look up the value of based on the temperature and pressure of the air, so around 1.1 kilograms per meter cubed. Lastly, the drag coefficient and the reference area work together to account for both the shape and the size of a falling object. Looking up the drag coefficient for a parachute shape gets you a value of 1.4, and then the corresponding frontal area can be calculated using the measured diameter of about 17.5 centimeters, assuming the chute looks something like this as it falls. Plugging in those values, and now we've got a simplified equation that relates the velocity of the parachute man at any point in time to his acceleration. We still don't know the values of either of these at all points in time, but rather than panic, let's just take it one step at a time and solve this numerically. We do know from measuring that the initial height is 2.38 meters and that the initial velocity is zero. So at this instance where the parachute man has just been released and isn't moving yet, you can plug in the velocity to see that there would be no influence of drag and the acceleration of the parachute man is just due to gravity. Next, we'll assume this will be his acceleration for a short period of time, let's say 0.1 seconds. Obviously this isn't true because as soon as he starts moving there will be drag, but we can check if this time step is small enough later, so let's just continue for now. If the parachute man accelerates at this constant rate for 0.1 seconds, based on the definition of acceleration, we can integrate to find out how much the velocity changed during this step. As a reminder, integrating is essentially calculating the area under the curve, which for this step is the area of a rectangle that's 0.1 seconds wide times negative 9.8 meters per second squared tall which gets you a decrease in velocity of 0.98 meters per second, which we can then plot on the velocity graph. Just like last episode, based on the definition of velocity, we can integrate again to find out how much the vertical position changed during this step. The calculated area of this triangle is negative 0.05 meters, bringing the height of the parachute man down to 2.33 meters. Now that the parachute man has a non-zero velocity, we need to use this velocity to calculate the next instantaneous acceleration which comes out to negative 5.9. You can now use the area under the curve for these two most recent acceleration points to estimate how much the velocity changed during this second step. And then, again, use the two most recent velocities to estimate how much the position changed during the second step. If you're sensing a pattern, great, because you can just repeat these steps over and over and over again until the parachute man hits the ground. Which sounds like a lot of work, but if you do it using a computer, it's quite easy. Immediately, you might notice some funky behavior in the shape of the graphs. Unless there was like a gust of wind, the parachute man should never have a positive acceleration. But this choppiness is due to the step size being too large that it cycles between overestimating and underestimating the solution. If I cut the step size in half from 0.1 seconds to 0.05 seconds, meaning twice as many calculations, I can see that there's less choppiness, but still some. So I'll make the step size an additional five times smaller down to 0.01 seconds and we start to see each of the graphs converging to a solution. I could decrease it further but it's not going to change much and this is good enough. So now we've got our full solution where the parachute man starts accelerating primarily due to gravity and as he picks up more speed there's a larger and larger drag force until his acceleration approaches zero and he's reached terminal velocity. From here his velocity is of course a constant meaning his position is decreasing linearly until he reaches the ground 1.65 seconds after release, and that's how the line was set. Pause now to predict how reality will vary from this simple model. And now it's time to see what actually happened. With the parachute man set in place, it was time to wait for him to drop. And this whole video could almost be a tape commercial because 45 minutes later, he was still hanging on. I got impatient, so I decided to shoot him down and start over with a smaller piece of tape. But even after the Nerf bullet grazed the string, he was still hanging on. I figured that might have loosened him though, so I decided to wait a few more minutes, and sure enough, he came soaring down. From release to impact took 1.92 seconds, meaning the over has hit. 
Congrats to those who got it right, and as always, let me know in the comments which specific factors you think contributed the most to it being over. Thanks for watching to the end, and I'll see you next time.